Holly is the author of seven novels, the most recent of which is My Ex-Life. His first novel, The Object of My Affection, was turned into a movie with a screenplay by Wendy Wasserstein and starring Jennifer Aniston and Paul Rudd. His fiction reviews and articles have appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Harper's Vogue, and many other publications. He currently serves as director of creative writing at Brandeis University. Paul Goldberg's debut novel, The Yid, was published in 2016 to widespread acclaim and named a finalist for both the Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Liter Literature and the National Jewish Book Awards Goldberg Prize for Debut Fiction. As a reporter, Paul has written two books about the Soviet human rights movement and has co-authored the book How We Do Harm, an expose of the US healthcare system. His latest novel is The Chateau. He lives in Washington, DC. John Methven is the author of three novels, Therapy Mammals, Strange Boat, and This Is Your Captain Speaking. His work has appeared in McSweeney's Internet Tendency, The New York Times, New York Magazine, BuzzFeed, The Atlantic, and The All. He lives in New York City with his wife and sons. So please welcome my authors. Um, I'm gonna start with you. You go okay. first. Um, thank you very much for coming. Um, I thought I would begin um, by telling you the most interesting and the most uh, deliciously dark thing about my uh, rather light novel, um, which is that it has the same publisher and the same editor as James Comey's book. Um, and this fact has led me to believe that it has enormous global significance, uh, even though, in fact, uh, it's really a domestic uh, comedy uh, about people and um, ex-lives. And as to uh, ex-lives, um, what I mean by that is that when you get to a certain point in your life, like the point I'm at in my life right now, I recently turned 45, and more recently than that, I turned 62, and... Um, <laughs> You kind of look in the rearview mirror and you see a bunch of ex-lives piling up behind you. Uh, this could be like a city that you lived in that you thought was your forever home, you know, to use an HGTVism that I find kind of cringy but is useful. Um, or um, a job that you thought was a lifelong career or a relationship that you thought would last until death hopefully of the other person, um, <laughs> but, uh, but because things usually don't go the way we think they will, uh, you know, you moved or you, uh, you know, got a different job and uh, the relationship evolved in ways that you hadn't been anticipating. Uh, as a character in this novel observes, all couples start off as Romeo and Juliet and end up as Laurel and Hardy, meaning that rather than address your problems and your dysfunctions, you kind of turn it into a uh, stand-up routine that you perform at weddings and uh, cocktail parties and places where they serve alcohol. Um, and the question that I wanted to explore in this novel is, do, is, in the pursuit of happiness, is the best thing to do to continue on the road ahead uh, with the expectation that there's kind of a perfect life and a happy relationship and an ideal situation waiting for you somewhere on the road ahead of you, or uh, is it best to revisit and reconstruct some portion of uh, your ex-life? Not to make the same mistakes that you made the first time around, but to take what was good about a relationship or a career or whatever and um, reconfigure it to adapt to your newer, more mature, less restless, perhaps less hormonal needs. Um, and is that really where you are likely to find happiness? Um, as for the specifics of this novel, um, it is about uh, David and Julie are the protagonists. They were married when they were in their early 20s uh, and divorced shortly thereafter. They went to opposite coasts. David went to California. Julie went to the East Coast, to a town north of Boston. Um, and um, <clears throat> David came out as gay. Julie remarried and has a 17-year-old daughter. Um, but these lives have not turned out to be the ideal situations they had been hoping for either. David is helping the spoiled children of rich San Franciscans get into the colleges their parents think they deserve to get into and I've been teaching on the college level for 30 years, so I know all about that. Um, and um, 
and Julie is running a kind of a shabby Airbnb operation out of her rambling Victorian house um, in order to fund her second divorce. Um, and um, what else can I say? The third person involved in this is Julie's teenage daughter, 17-year-old daughter, whose name is Mandy. And uh, she has the enormous misfortune of having been named after a Barry Manilow song. And uh, she will not unable to forgive her parents for this particular humiliation. Uh, Julie invites her ex-husband, David, back from California to help uh, her daughter with college applications. And little by little, they find themselves forming a kind of um, unconventional family. Uh, the novel is basically a love story, although for obvious reasons, it's a love story that is not destined to end in a happy marriage. Um, and whether or not the novel ends happily at all is dependent upon some secrets that uh, Julie has been keeping for a number of decades and some really uh, bad decisions that Mandy, the 17-year-old, has been making. So um, I don't know if you'll find the book as interesting or informative as James Comey's book, um, but uh, I, I think it will find it probably a little bit funnier than that book. Um, the, uh, the publisher wrote a tagline for the book, you know, like they do for movies, like Pray for Rosemary's Baby, or my personal favorite, Armageddon, had a tagline, Earth. It was fun while it lasted. Um, and this one was, home is where your ex is, which kind of sums up the idea behind the book, although I would say for accuracy, there should be a question mark at the end of it. So thank you for listening. That's about my book. So. Paul, have you go next. All right. So my novel is, uh, is getting as close as you can get to uh, the headlines of the day, which is, um, w well, we know what they are. Um, <laughs> at the most recent presidential election, I was shocked to see how seamlessly America's extreme right converged with the remnants of Russia's extreme left. I was also amazed to realize that Donald Trump had more than just support of the expatriate Russian community here in the US, but that he's actually loved. So uh, I'm not a Florida person, and I'm not a beach person, and I don't play golf. But just after I finished my first novel, The Yid, a comedy about Stalin's death, find comedy where you find, when, you know, where you get it. Uh, my father waged a campaign to become a member of his condo board in Hollywood, Florida. Listening to him, I started to realize how deeply contested these elections were, or can be. And here's the chateau in a nutshell. Uh, the protagonist, Bill Katzenellen Boygan, uh, a nebuchadnezzar reporter and a science writer, is fired by the Washington Post. Uh, meanwhile, in Florida, his college roommate, a prominent plastic surgeon, dies under suspicious and, of course, salacious circumstances. Um, a former girlfriend convinces Bill to write a book about the death. It's kind of his Hail Mary pass uh, to revive his career. So he has says, all right, I'll do it. Um, Unfortunately, he has to, to, to pull this off. He has to stay with his father, uh, with whom he hasn't spoken in 12 years. And usually, when people don't speak with each other for members of the family for, for a dozen years, they have good reasons for this. Um, so at this building, the chateau, factions of very tough old people, all of them seasoned fighters, square off in a brutal fight over control of the building, and more importantly, its finances. Uh, the stakes are in the millions, millions spent on regular upkeep, and many more uh, on capital projects. Special assessments at the Chateau will be astronomical, and a, wait, uh, and a wave of defaults will surely follow. Now, kickbacks at this place are generous and blatant. Um, the principal construction contractor is referred to as the sponsor. 
if you are on the board of directors and if you're good, the sponsor will give you a three-year lease for a white Lexus. Since it's Russian people, we have to have white Lexus. Um, in this setting, I play out many conflicts at once, uh, including, so it's really basically Turgenev's uh, fathers and sons, but set in a much more pleasant climate, or if you like Florida. Um, it's a big if. Um, so to me, a novel must have a big character in its center. And the biggest character in the chateau, bigger than even Donald Trump, which, by the way, is pronounced Donald Trump, 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 in, uh, in with the Russian accent. And uh, so the biggest character in this book is Melser Yakovlevich Katzenelenboygen. I chose this name because it's just the longest Jewish name known to me. So Melser fills the room. Melser is a former refusenik. Melser is a poet. Mel Melser is a Medicaid fraudster. Melser is a demagogue. Melser is a predator. Melser is a passionate Trump supporter. Melser wants to gain control of the board. He wants your money. Uh, his name, by the way, means Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, and the October Revolution, which is enough for four statues, maybe five, and Melser wants all five because Melser is big. Now, I should tell you about a few things about Florida. This is how Bill sees it. And of course, he could be wrong. And I'm going to just read a little bit. Even if you would rather be any place but South Florida, you may not be immune to the feeling of infinite possibility manifest in the first exposure to sunlight that pierces through the cab's windshield the instant you emerge from the shadows of structured parking at Fort Lauderdale, Lauderdale Hollywood International Airport. Even if you would rather be any place other than, how can you not take note that uh, this flash so completely captures the absence of cultural constipation. Has any place, any culture so fully embraced the pursuit of pleasure with such small d democratic, small c catholicism? If you're an asshole, be an asshole. If you want a machine gun, get a machine gun. If you want it to snort coke, snort coke. If you want to defraud your neighbor, defraud your neighbor. If you want to fuck a giraffe, arrangements can be made to enable you to fuck a giraffe. If you want to vote for him whose name is too painful to utter as coronation nears, vote for him whose name is too painful to utter as coronation nears. If you want to be a machine gun toting, uh, coke snorting, giraffe fucking, neighbor defrauding, Trump supporting fascist asshole, be a machine gun toting, coke snorting, giraffe fucking, neighbor defrauding, Trump supporting fascist asshole. So uh, if you like Russian poetry, uh, if you like good Russian poetry, do not read the Chateau. So the protagonist's father, Melser, writes occasional poetry. Uh, and occasional poetry always sucks. Um, and his is for the inauguration of his beloved Donald Trump. It's in the form of Chistushki, which is sort of limerick-like. Well, I'm going to read it in Russian and in English, just one, but there's tons. So, в Вашингтонском да в болоте крокодилы плавают, а народ им говорит, будем с Путиным дружить и болото здесь сушить. The Potomac swamp of late big green crocodiles populate. Our Putin and our Trump will soon drain that stinking swamp. So. The characters in the chateau speak a kind of mixture of Russian and English, which is usually done without articles. Just get rid of all of them, and then just maybe use a wrong word here and there. So the words go back and forth from language to language. And so consider this word, Druika, which is any form of a Jewish social service organization. So let's say dementia takes the better of a Russian person. What happens? Druika sends van from mental health. Articles, of course, are not used. And when one of my characters alleges violation of Florida law, she shouts, you violate Florida statue. And difficult to imagine, but uh, now here's the thing that really amazed me <coughs> in Florida as I was reporting this book. Um, there's this Russian word which I rarely use. I speak Russian a lot. Uh, but this word is, I just it never really enters my, my vocabulary here. And the word is svolich, which is fascinating. It comes, 
it, it basically what it is, is a, it, it's a loosely translated as a low life, but it comes from a word volok, which is felt. So it's kind of a loss of integrity, of individual strands, of moral, um, moral integrity, moral fiber. And I've known this word a lot, all my life, but I really never really heard of it uh, used as much as it is used in, on the Broadwalk in Hollywood. Just hear it. Um, so when my protagonist goes running on the Broadwalk, he starts to understand what he sees uh, as he ponders this place called Florida. So Bill passes the security gate at 6.17 a.m. He is not the first inhabitant of the chateau to step out into, into darkness. Three others, sad-faced men, 75 plus minus 10, stand outside the building waiting patiently as their little white dogs contemplate emptying their tiny bladders and bowels. There's a joke about such men. Why do Jewish men die before their wives? Because they want to. <laughs> it's possible that these men are goyim, but the joke still stands, Goyam my people, this is about dogs. These dogs aren't dogs. All three, no wait, there are four. All four are well under the weight of weight limit of 15 pounds specified in the condo do's and don'ts. These dogs don't apprehend tiny bad guys. They don't sniff out little explosives or baby cadavers, but they do have a mission. They substitute for the grandchildren who don't come to visit. They aren't especially good at breathing, which is why they sometimes ride in baby strollers. They spend their days listening to complaints about mommy, about daddy, about the sadly deteriorating physical and allegedly mental health of both, about doctors who overcharge while failing to acknowledge the obvious signs of mini strokes and myelodysplastic syndrome, about Obamacare, about unappreciative rude family members, and of course, about the condo, the crooked condo board, Svolici. The dogs listen and they wheeze. If they could kill themselves, they would. When you are smaller than a cat and lack opposable thumbs, it's hard to pull the trigger. Someday little guns will be made for this niche market. Why do these dogs get Prozac? Because they need it. Bill runs past the silent scooper wielding sentries of the chateau gates and heads north on Ocean Drive. So uh, a, a wise man I know uh, term, coined this strange term in uh, Florida, and the term is balkanization, as in balcony. Um, and it stands for knocking down balconies and replacing them regardless of whether it's necessary to do so. At the chateau, the balconies are quite sturdy, but the sponsor wants them replaced and the board wants a kickback. So you see similar projects undertaken up and down Florida. And now here's what Bill, here's Bill's reflection triggered by balkanization. Let's say you devoted your life to screwing other people. You break no more laws than you have to. You avoid being disgorged. You build a goodly stash. You move to Florida. You get fucked by your condos, B-O-D. You sta your stash gets drawn down. You try a new fraud, but it fails. The world is changing. You're losing your touch. You move on to a lesser place, or you start whacking people across their backs with, the co with a, your crooked cake and cane until Juica carts you away. You might die in the middle of it. You might want to. You will make room for fresh, idealistic 67-year-olds to take their turn at the good life by the sea. And that's... <laughs> uh, good morning, my name is John Methvin, and uh, I'm the author of Therapy Mammals. Um, everybody hear me in the back? All right. So my book is about, uh, it's about an unreliable narrator. His name is uh, Tom Pistolini, and it starts with his nickname. So everybody calls him Pisser. And... <clears throat> Everything's going wrong. He's got a lot of crises in his life. He's, uh, his wife is, is having an affair with a motivational speaker. And his name is Ray McClutchin, so this guy's nickname is Clutch. And his nickname is Pisser, so right there, nothing's working for this guy. He's, um, 
his, uh, he's a meteorologist, and he, his, his newsroom has just been purchased by a, uh, a millennial website, and they're making a lot of changes. It's obviously not going to include this guy. Um, he's, you know, he's a father, and he's kind of, he's kind of, I describe him as the Patrick Bateman of the, of the private school community because he's, he's really sort of lost it. He's, um, he's, what people describe him as is somebody that lacks playfulness. So he's taking um, self-prescribed medication to make, to kind of dig out the playfulness in his life, make him more playful. Um, the problem is it, it causes a lot of crazy stuff going on in his life. He blacks out a lot. And when he comes to, he's doing strange things. He, he steals a, um, there's a rival woman in his school and she has a prosthetic leg. He steals the leg from her. He, uh, what else does he do? He, he kidnaps a feral cat because he has a, uh, he has a, a chipmunk infestation in his, in his jacuzzi and he needs to get rid of them, but he's not allowed to, he can't shoot them, so he's gotta, he's gotta kill them somehow. So he, he gets this cat and it becomes his therapy mammal. And, it's, and he sort of sees himself in this cat and he really likes, he, he becomes to really enjoy this cat a lot living in his, his backyard. Um, he, um, he's also having, uh, as he's having these, these blackouts, he's having trouble with uh, the, the, his high school, the, his daughter's high school lacrosse coach because sorry, his daughter's high school lacrosse team because somebody on the team has compromising pictures of his daughter. Um, and so he's in this battle with the lacrosse team. He may have killed his nanny. It's just everything ab about his life is you don't really know exactly what he's talking about. And it does present a, c a c comedic effect just because he's, he's very screwed up. Um, the book opens with, with him actually, his, he's strangling the captain of the lacrosse team and so I'm just gonna I'm gonna read a little bit about that, and then uh, you'll get the gist of, of the book. So morning drop off, teachable moments, Toby. I say the fundamental component of progress, the things we do for our children. This is my predicament as I come out of the darkness to find my hands wrapped around Toby Dalton's warm neck. The notion is residue from an earlier blog post on the Gopal website on the topic of sacrifice and commitment. My knuckled fingers a demonstration that our words as parents translate into actionable guardianship. Everyone likes Toby. He is popular, handsome. Like much of the student body, he comes from wealth, which gives him an optimistic sheen, a glorious yelp that privilege has its merits, nice hair, immaculate teeth, a dapper glow. His neck is bronzed and soft, a teenager who understands the benefits of luxury moisturizers and can afford them. I feel the restorative properties from his skin surge through my fingers as I shove his head against the cement wall. Captain of the Gopal lacrosse team in his junior year, Toby is going places. So that's Pisser, and he's kind of crazy, and I think you'll all enjoy this book. Thank you. Um, I have questions for the authors, but we're also taking ones for the audience. So if anybody has them, just raise your hand, and I'll call on you. Um, my first question for all three of you is whether humor is your primary way of coping with life especially now that Trump is in office. <laughs> uh, Trump's actually, if I could kind of may maybe restate this and sort of reinterpret this, uh, Trump's actually very good for writers and humorists uh, because he's making us relevant. Um, so uh, I sit there and I read the newspaper and I don't know whether to laugh or cry, which I guess is really what a dark humorist does. Uh, it's that sort of like, you never figure it out. You don't want to, so you're kind of stuck. So I'm just kind of stuck between the humor of it and the realism of it, and it's all exactly the same thing. So it's, it's hard to distinguish. I mean, I think most of my friends, it seems to me, get their news from uh, The Daily Show and uh, Samantha Bee and people who are essentially comedians. Um, and it's sort of the only way that I think a lot of people can tolerate um, what they consider an intolerable tolerable situation. But as for fallback positions, I mean, I think that making something uh, amusing or attempting to out of uh, a painful situation has always been kind of my fallback position in life which I'm sort of hoping will make 
death a little bit easier when it comes around, you know? I'll let you know how that works out. <laughs> yeah, I would agree that, um, you know, you gotta laugh at, you gotta laugh at the world. As bad as things get, as bad as, you know, they're gonna get, I think you have to find the, the comedy in it. Um, one of the websites I write for is Timothy McSweeney's uh, Internet Tendency, and anything you submit, it just seems like it has to be related to Trump or the headline. So in that regard, I think he's had a, an impact on what people are writing. I would agree, yeah. Um, and what do you think the difference between dark and funny is, or are they too close together to be different? Um, well, dark and funny, there's a, you had another question that you were going to ask, but I, I think it, to, to me, this is kind of the answer to both of them. But I think when you're dark, dark comedy is what makes us very uncomfortable. So if, if you're, if you've written a dark comedy, it can make you very uncomfortable because it's, it's something in your life that, um, you can relate to and, you know, you can make something funny. Uh, I wrote a, I wrote a piece for the McSweeney's about, um, Han Solo's therapy animal, which is 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 a Wookiee, right? That's funny. That's not real. But if you're if you're writing a book that's that's a dark comedy, it's something that you can relate to in your life, and it's 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 more personal. I mean, I I feel uh, I mean I don't feel as if I write dark comedies. I um, so I was actually excited to be on this panel because. I'm used to feeling out of place um, wherever I am, and so uh, you know th that was it's very comforting to me. Um, but I I think that uh, you know the that some in order for something to be funny to me it has to have an element of truth in it, you know. And if it doesn't ring true about human behavior, about the way people are in their lives, their relationships, etc., then I don't think it's necessarily funny. And that often can lead into kind of uh, dark territory. Um, so I think it makes things a little bit more tolerable, perhaps. I kind of, to me, I mean, there's dark humor is an animal with many faces, but uh, the face I like the most is where a reader is looking at what's this horrible things happening to the character and wants to laugh and does laugh, but then feels really guilty about laughing. So it's like the big, the be, the best. This is a, a joke that comes from Freud's jokes and their relation to the unconscious and other places as well, because it's just it's so damn old. It's probably 150 years old. But there was a series of jokes that began with a Jew is facing a firing squad. Okay, and so here's one version of it. There's thousands probably, but here's one version. His last words, I can already tell this is going to be a bad day. It's funny, but you're laughing at somebody who's facing a firing squad. Hey, you know, someone said to me the other day, oh, I, I really love your books. Are you really that cynical? And I said, I guess, you know, like, I'm so cynical that I don't think I'm cynical. I mean, you know, I think I'm, I, I think I'm very optimistic, but I don't know. But humor writers are not cynical in a way because cynical is political writers. Uh, I'm, uh, cynical is certainly speech writers, but it's uh, cynical. A cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing, and we know the value. That would of be me. <laughs> yeah, it would. I, I would disagree. We can argue about it. Okay. Okay. I think we have a question from the audience. Do you guys ever find yourselves? Yeah, I think I think that's absolutely um, the person that you're writing is you're spending all this time with. I mean, I spend more time with with Tom Pistolini than my wife, so I I'm gonna make him into a real person and and try to see the world through his eyes, um, through his like crazy eyes. So yeah, absolutely. Do you are you a writer? No. <laughs> that sounded like yes, actually. <laughs> That sounds even more like yes. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like when you're writing something, you kind of be, be, you begin to see the world a little bit more through the character's eyes. You know, I find that's true for me anyway. And I've written a lot of books in the first person, and um, it can get very claustrophobic. 
uh, which is one of the reasons my current book is not written in the first person, because I just couldn't stand the idea of being in one character's head for you know, a couple of years or eight. <laughs> well, I mean, the whole act of creating a character is a form of dialogue with some part of your life that that you want to kind of get in touch with and communicate with, so yeah. Um, I had another question wanting to know if you've ever written something funny that people took seriously. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think that was a yes. My father is not speaking with me because he thinks he is uh, the protagonist's father <laughs> in this book, which Which is he is, probably, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the life, the life he leads, the community he is a part of, uh, certainly. But none of the events in the book really happened. I mean, there's, there's this boundary between reality and fiction, and it's it's definable because you, you know, if you if if you take liberties with that, you might actually get sued. <laughs> it's I I know that, and I don't, but so maybe <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I I mean I, I you know I don't know I I am always would be delighted if anyone took anything I wrote seriously. Um, this, uh, I was on a panel once and these people were, and all these people saying, oh, with like a bunch of people and there was, and somebody in the audience saying, oh, my mother thinks, uh, you loves your books and they're so wonderful and they said about the other person, etc. And I thought like, no one's ever said to me, my mother loves your books. Like some person said to me once, you know, my mother is disturbed by your books. <laughs> which happened to be my brother. Um, so <laughs> I guess that's taking it seriously on some level. But. I, uh, everybody, some people know Susan Miller. She's an astrolo astrologer. Uh, she's a very popular astrologer. And she, a few years ago for The Atlantic, I wrote a piece about um, when, when, her, when her horoscopes, her monthly horoscopes come out, like they have to come out on the first day of the, of the, of the month or people go, they go bananas. And I wrote an article about there's a group of um, people that hate it when they don't come out. Called I called them the Susanistas, and then there's a group that that they protect Susan Miller. They think if they protect her, that she'll write like nice horoscopes about them. They were called the Millerites, and I I basically I interviewed different groups of them and talked about how they were doing battle. And they still email me to this day, telling me how much they hate me. They both hate me. And Susan Miller has blocked me on Twitter. She, she, she hates me. She doesn't. She won't talk to me. It's just. So, it was a fun article about astrology, which I believe is is you know I don't really believe in astrology. So I was having fun with the how serious people take it, but um, they do take it very seriously. So. Did she have to block you on Twitter though? Couldn't she yeah. just write a really bad horoscope? Yeah, exactly, right? Like, I'm, now I, I am, I did get superstitious about it and wonder, like, oh, my God, is she going to, can she do anything? But she really can't. She's a good writer, but she's, she's a fiction writer, right? But she doesn't see it that way. But I love that idea that you can kind of coax a good outcome out of her, you know, by they, being they, nice to her and so it's, on. If you go, go on Twitter, Susan Miller, on on June 2nd and watch it because she's late every month and people lose their minds. Huh. <laughs> wow. You should lie to you. You're still like promoting I know. Like yeah. She's, yeah. We're she's all going to go look. Yeah. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience? Sure. Um, I was wondering if you felt either any internal or external pressure from either writing or being in the Yeah, it's, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. Well, you know, I'm, I'm Russian, so nihilism comes naturally. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, there was a review of my book that where the character was accused of being nihilistic, and I just said, "Wait, but that's like accusing Ben Gurion of being a Zionist." So, yeah, I, I don't really think about that, but 
I've had editors tell me that, um, like at least have some characters come to some reconciliation, think of something positive, but that's just against my religion. <laughs> I wrote a novel, and, and at the end, um, a dog gets lost and is not never found, and the editor said, well, that's the end of your career. Um, so I never, and since it was almost true, um, I've <laughs> tried. But I think kind of the opposite, which is I think by nature I tend to want to resolve things in a somewhat positive way. And the uh, kind of challenge for me is to write about things that are, are that don't go toward cartoon, but actually deal with more serious issues. And there's a teenager, as I said, in this uh, new book, my ex-life, uh, who kind of gets into some trouble um, with uh, a person. And, you know, um, so the, the challenge was actually not going too kind of creepy with that, you know, um, because the essential feeling of the book, I wanted to be uh, comedic, so. In my first novel, like, at the end, uh, this is your captain speaking, I killed everybody. And my editor wow. said, <laughs> I just, that's how I resolved it. And my editor said, that's not how this works. Right. Um, <laughs> nobody's going to want to read your book and, you know, get emotionally attached to your characters and then not, you just, at the end, just say, everybody's dead. So you have to, you have to put them, you know, put your characters in these dark comedic situations and then I think you have to show the, show the reader how to, how to resolve it, how to make it all better. More questions from the audience? Do you like happy endings? Yeah. Yeah. I think as long as it feels like it's been earned, you know, that, that yeah. it's good to have a, you know, some sense of, I mean, for me, not, but, you know, yeah. a, a little bit of hopefulness at the end so that I feel like I've invested my time in something that has some ray of hope, you know. Um, maybe, maybe I was too glib in what I said because uh, uh, the thing I can always, uh, the thing that happens in both my novels and will probably happen in the next one, is there's a kind of a moral and ethical victory to this whole thing. Uh, so a victory, even though things can be, you can be nihilistic throughout, it kind of goes and takes you to a, to a place where we triumph over them. Unless there's another question, I think we're almost out of time, so we're going to go to the signing tent. I've never been to a reading where so many people were wearing Wellington boots. <laughs> I think that's really cool. So thank you all so oh, much yeah. for coming, and thanks thank to my author. Thank you. Thank you.